Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Live at 5.55 on this Wednesday morning. We are in Revelation chapter 11, and uh, we're looking at verses 8 through 10 today. Revelation chapter 11, verses 8 through 10 says this, And their dead bodies, they lie in the streets of the great city, which is uh, spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from every people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Um, these are the two witnesses that we've been talking about throughout Revelation chapter 11. They are given power to prophesy, uh, to speak God's word, God's truth during this time. They've been giving power protection um, until, as we saw yesterday in Revelation chapter 11 verse 7, that their testimony was complete. And once their testimony was complete, guess what? They went home. Jesus called them home because you have no business being here any longer than your testimony is complete. You don't want to be here beyond your testimony. So when your testimony is complete, just like the two witnesses, Jesus will call you home and he calls them home and they die. And here's what happens with their bodies now. Verse number eight says, and their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city. What is this great city? We'll find out here in a couple words. And the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, we understand the spiritual climate of this great city presently. It's not good. If, you, if uh, your city is likened spiritually into Sodom and Egypt, uh, you're not doing real well spiritually. And this great city that they're talking about during this time of the tribulation where these two witnesses' bodies are going to be laid is the same city, verse 8 says, where also our Lord was crucified. That would be Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where these uh, two witnesses are going to be killed at. And their bodies are going to lay there in the streets. For how long? Verse 9 tells us. Then those from every people, tribe, tongue, and nation will see their dead bodies three and a half days. And allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves. These two witnesses that are proclaiming God's truth during the time that the Antichrist is ruling and reigning, they're going to come onto the scene from power from above to prophesy, power from above for protection. And now we see that they are going to be ultimately killed, either by the Antichrist or by his people, and they're going to be with Jesus. But their bodies are still here on the earth because that's how that works. Our bodies are physical. They stay here. And these bodies are staying in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half years days and notice what it says in verse 8 it says that the dead bodies will lay in the streets of jerusalem that great city which is spiritually called jerusalem verse 9 uh, then those from every people tribe tongue and nation will see their dead bodies laying there in the streets for three and a half days this is fascinating stuff because we understand how that can happen now a hundred years ago 50 years ago we did not have the technology for people to see the streets of Jerusalem day and night for three and a half years. And it's fun. I have some, you know, I have books here in the back. Quite a few of these, particularly the ones on the top shelf here that run along my office are commentaries, Bible commentaries. And um, many of those older ones from, and when I say older, I mean um, mid-1900s, 1960s, 70s, 80s, even 90s. When they talk about this idea of everyone being able to see what's taking place there in Jerusalem, they reference news. They reference CNN. They go, yeah, you know, people have TV in their houses and, you know, CNN or, or on NBC, you know, every night on the news, you'd be able to see it. It's like, yeah, they didn't even realize where the technology would be in the future where we're living today, where literally either everyone has a smartphone, which is what I'm using right now to record this, and to go live, either everyone has a smartphone, or guess what? They're pretty dang close to someone that does have one. And with Facebook Live, and YouTube, and Google, and all these platforms, it's very easy for the technology to exist, for an event to be happening in Jerusalem, 
like these two witnesses dead bodies laying in the streets and for anyone and everyone across the entire globe to pull out their smartphone out of their pocket go to a live feed and watch those bodies lay there in the street just like that and everyone notice what it says there in verse 9 and those people the people from every tribe and and tongue and nation all over the world is what he's saying there people from all over the world will be aware of what's happening in Jerusalem and they'll be able to see what's happening in Jerusalem. And today we have that technology, which is just another proof to the fact that we live in the last days. That this is plausible. This can happen with the technology that exists on the scene. We'll get into some more of that when we get into uh, talking about the mark of the beast, which people love about. But right now we just see that we have media technology that allows us to witness what's taking place. Right now, actually on YouTube, there's a live video feed that goes 24-7 of the uh, the Western Wall. And you can just go to YouTube and watch all these people go to the Western Wall and pray day and night. And it just, it's just a camera that sits up there. You can't really hear anything, but you just watch people there at the Western Wall. It's like, wow, there'll be something like that where there'll be some sort of camera set up that's watching the bodies of these two witnesses because... They're not a big, the system does not like these two witnesses. And the fact that they've been trying to kill them for three and a half years, and every time they tried, they had supernatural protection, even maybe fire coming out of their mouth. These would be big news stories. And now all of a sudden, these guys that have been untouchable, who have been proclaiming the truth of God, which is just annoying the people, the elite during this time, uh, these people are, these two witnesses have finally been able to be killed. And that's going to be breaking news. Breaking news now in Jerusalem. These two witnesses that have been proclaiming God's word for the past three and a half years and have been unable to be touched have finally been killed. And people will rejoice, right? They're happy because the Antichrist has them all screwed up. And now they're going to like celebrate by watching their bodies. And that actually tells us this. Um, where am I here? Verse 9. Then those from the people, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their bodies lying for three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. Let's bury them. Nope. Leave them there in the streets. Interesting. Verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice, verse 10 tells us, over them, making merry and sending gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Why, why would they make such a big deal about these two guys being killed? Because these two guys were tormenting them. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But all the earth dwellers, and notice that, those who dwell on the earth, when they see the breaking news that these two prophets have been killed, there's going to be rejoicing. The world is going to celebrate. Man, finally, these guys who have been, you know, talking about that, you know, intolerant God's word, you know, all those Christians disappeared you know, three and a half years ago, we don't really know what happened to them. The government explained them away by alien abduction or something. But now all of a sudden came onto the scene these 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 crazy Jewish dudes who have been speaking God's intolerant word. And, and it really drives the system, this world crazy. And now they see that they've dead, that they're dead and they rejoice. They're like, oh, finally, we don't have to hear God's word being prophesied to us anymore. They rejoice over them. Not only that, they make merry and they send gifts. They turn it into a holiday, like Christmas almost. D did you see? Here's a gift in honor of the, the two prophets that are dead in the streets of Jerusalem. The two witnesses. Weird climate that's taking place during the tribulation period. Strange stuff that's happening. But the world rejoices at it. Why? Verse 10 goes on to say, and we're almost done here. It says... Because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. The reason why they're rejoicing at their death is because those two prophets, by prophesying God's word, were actually tormenting the people who were dwelling on the earth. How? By speaking the truth. By speaking the truth, the earth dwellers, and I make that distinction because the church is now heaven dwellers. We're in heaven because of the rapture. And now you have the earth dwellers. The earth dwellers are tormented at the speaking of truth, at God's word going forth. And it bothered them so much that finally when these people who are speaking forth God's word dies, 
they rejoice. They turn it into a holiday. Here's what I find interesting about this. These guys are doing what God called them to do. It's to prophesy. It's to proclaim his word. And to some, it was pure torment. Oh, they're, 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 they're pleasing to God, living out their calling. But to those who don't belong to God, watching someone do what God has called them to do drives them crazy. And Paul kind of talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 13. He says, or verse 15 rather, he says, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the ones who, to the one, we are an aroma of death leading to death. To the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Paul says, you and us, you and me as Christians, we smell. We're the fragrance. We're the aroma of Christ. To those who are perishing, we stink. To those who are saved, we smell good. These two witnesses, they're doing what God's called them to do. They're a sweet-smelling aroma to Jesus. They're, they're, they're an incense offering. To, they smell good to Jesus because they're doing what Jesus has called them to do. To saved people... Their ministry smells good. What they're doing with their life smells good. But to those who are perishing, to the unsaved, they look at the witness of these two witnesses and it's like torment. It stinks like something awful. Why? Because they're perishing. The same smell smells sweet to one, yet gross to the other. Maybe you have that, right? Maybe you just absolutely love the smell of whatever and you know whoever you, you live with or whatever, you can't stand it. It's like, how is it that we are smelling the same thing and it's enjoyable to me and not to you? Well, that's how believers are. That's how you and I are as Christians. Literally, there's people that are tormented at the fact of us gathering together here this morning talking about Revelation chapter 11. They can't stand it. They think it's just the craziest, stupidest, biggest waste of time that you could ever do. Why didn't you sleep in 15 more minutes? That's what they think. It's a torment to them. But, what's the Bible say? To those who are perishing, it stinks. But, to those who are saved, it's a sweet-smelling aroma. This is weird. It's weird that you would wake up at 5.55 in the morning and watch some 24-year-old kid with his hat on backwards talk about the book of Revelation. But guess what? It smells good. Do you know why it smells good to you? Because it's God's word and because you're saved. So this kind of stuff, it smells good to you. Other people look at it and they think it's the biggest waste of time. It stinks to them. You know why? Because they're perishing. And they're the same type of people that would look at these two witnesses witness and say, that's torment to us. We're glad they're dead. And on the other hand, we look at the witness of these two witnesses and we go, that's awesome. They're boldly standing up for three and a half years proclaiming God's truth in the face of the Antichrist, not afraid in boldness. Interesting world we live in today. So, some people, here's the, here's the walk away, here's the take home point from today. You're going to smell regardless. You're going to smell good to some people, you're going to smell bad to other people. Our job is we're doing what Jesus has called us to do and we're walking with him. We're going to smell good to Jesus and we're going to smell good to those who are being saved. Guess what? As you're doing that, those who are perishing, they're going to think you stink. And when they tell you you stink, don't take it personally, okay? Because to us, you smell pretty good. Huh? That's kind of fun. Let's end on that note, and we'll, uh, we'll pray on this Wednesday. There we go. Sorry, I had a text come through. Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you for today, Lord. And um, God, I thank you that uh, like these two witnesses, Lord, all of us have a calling. Lord, like these two witnesses, all of us have a testimony. Lord, like these two witnesses, all of us are going to be here until our testimony is complete. Uh, but Lord, also like these two witnesses, as we're doing what you've called us to do, it's going to be received differently from people. Lord, some people are going to rejoice at the fact when our testimony is complete, not at the fact that they're happy we're in heaven, but because we were just annoying to them as we spoke God's word, as we lived uh, and walked with you. But Lord, as Paul says in Corinthians, we are a fragrance. Lord, we're smelly stuff. And Lord, we smell, we're the fragrance of you. We're the fragrance of Christ. We, Jesus, we smell like you, just like 
as that ointment, that alabaster was broken over you before you were crucified. And you, that smell that was on you filled the room and was covered on the lady. Now everything around you smells like you. Jesus, when we hang out with you, we don't just start to look like you. We start to smell like you. And Lord, that smell is a sweet-smelling aroma to the saved, to other Christians. It's a good thing. It's a pleasant thing to be around someone that smells like you, Lord. But to those who are perishing, it stinks. It's disgusting. It torments them. So, Lord, I just pray that we wouldn't take it personally when someone tells us we stink. <laughs> Lord, because hopefully it's just because we're smelling like you, because we've been spending time with you. And, Lord, if they don't like the way you smell, well, then, Lord, that's not our problem. Because I can't think of anything else I'd rather smell like Jesus than you. So, Lord, the more time we hang out with you, the more we become your aroma, your fragrance. And, Lord, the more pleasing we'll be to one another as believers. But, Lord, the world can look at us and say that we stink. Lord, I pray that we would just not take that personally on this Wednesday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Kind of an interesting study this morning, but I think it's a really uh, relevant one. Smell like Jesus. If you look really close, close, I actually don't know how to do this. Let me see. Right up here, this is some cologne I have in my office. Uh, here and here little bottles that I got from Dollar Shave Club, which is this thing I subscribe to. Anyway, the point is, as human beings, we like to smell good. We, we want to smell good at times. Smell like Jesus. Be the sweet-smelling aroma of Jesus. To us around you who are saved, we're going to go, man, you smell good. Have you been hanging out with Jesus? We'll be like, well, what can I say? <laughs> right? And to other people, they'd be like, something in this room stinks. This room smells like Jesus. I would hope so. It really offends other people, but it's a blessing to others. So today, maybe you're getting ready to cook for Thanksgiving. You're getting turkey ready or you're baking pies today. And the house is filled with the aroma of whatever it is you're cooking. Man, let's be sure that we have the aroma, the fragrance of Jesus this holiday season, this Thanksgiving season. As you gather together with family and friends, maybe some of them think a little differently than you. If your family is anything like my family, they think a little differently than you sometimes on some pretty important topics, quite honestly. But we can still gather together. We can share a meal. We can express thankfulness. But as you go into that situation, before you go, you know, put some Jesus on. Spray some Jesus. Spend some time in the presence of the Lord. And we'll do our live at 555 tomorrow morning. And, and you'll get some time in his word. Spend some time in his presence. Worship. Put some Jesus on so that when you're sitting around that table and, you, and, and, and they smell something, it's not the stinkiness of your pride or the stinkiness of uh, your works or the stinkiness of your self-righteousness. We don't want to smell like that. If people are going to smell, if unbelievers are going to smell anything on us, it better be Jesus. Amen? Let's be sure we do that. Have a blessed Wednesday. Tonight we're having our night of thanks at uh, the church here. Wednesday night at 6.30 tonight. So we got some different people bringing some soup and salad, some desserts, some cornbread, some different things. And uh, if you uh, aren't, weren't planning on coming, but you're like, man, that would be fun to come to, stop by. We'll have plenty of food. We're just going to set up some tables, have some soup, have a, a small meal, uh, talk about what we're thankful for. Just really have a good night. So hopefully... Um, We'll see you come out. If you want to bring something, you can. If, it's, if you don't want to, that's fine. Just show up anyway, and uh, we'll see you tonight. And we're just going to have a great time as a church family uh, on this night before Thanksgiving. So hopefully we'll see you then. If not, we'll see you tomorrow morning as we continue on in Revelation chapter 11.